Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. CJ, what a wild story around Ivan Fedotov, the Philadelphia Flyers goalie. He had signed a contract in 2022 in anticipation of joining the team and then gets ushered into military service in Russia. I remember back then it was a wild time, and now all of a sudden he is available and back in, not even back, he's in Philadelphia. Uh, By the time you'll get this podcast, he'll have spoken to media. What can you say about the story? What's next for this goaltender? Just, Just happy that he's in North America and he's able to play with the Flyers franchise, but what a wild story. Yeah, and timing is is pretty fascinating because, you know, Philadelphia is down to a handful of games left in the regular season, and Ivan Fedotov is due to become an unrestricted free agent on July 1st, and so, you know, I think the plan, of course, is for them to start working with him, get eyes that, of their own on him, not just on game footage, perhaps, you know, play him. But, you know, there's there's still a, a situation about whether he's signed for next year or does he hit the open market. And, you know, from just the hockey perspective, pretty intriguing player who's had a lot of success everywhere he's played. He, you know, he won a gold medal in 2022 as the goaltender of record at that event. Um, you know, he's been one of the the best regarded, if not the best regarded goaltender in Russia now for a few years. Six foot eight, um, which, you know, if you see the trend of the way goaltending is going in a league, uh, that that's that's a positive in in the box, but but you know then you, you you say what's what what can they expect from them in this short of time? They're in a playoff race. Uh, it's it is an unusual story, and it's nine years after they drafted him, right? And and you know as you mentioned, they tried to bring him over in 2022, ends up missing the entire 2022 23 season um, while serving that that military service in Russia. He returned this year and played for CSKA Moscow. That's after the double IHF last summer had a ruling that the Flyers contract was the legal one. So he played technically on in the eyes of international hockey in a legal contract this year in Russia. So, yes, I think it's it's a story that's had a lot of twists and turns. He kind of gets dropped into a very interesting time in the Flyers net. An interesting time of their season. And, you know, he at the end of the day, we're a hockey podcast. He's a pretty intriguing player, but I, I just, I don't know what, what can be expected, how much reasonably the Flyers can learn. And, and, you know, they do have a decision. They have a couple of decisions this summer, but one of them would be what becomes a Fedotov. Obviously we don't know if Carter Hart's going to get a qualifying offer by, by the date in June that he's supposed to. And so there's a lot of moving pieces in the Flyers crease, but um, you know, needless to say, I think they're pretty happy to, to get him over to North America. Finally, to at least have any sort of chance to gauge where he might be at and what his NHL future might be. I wonder how many games he gets in between now and the end of the season. And if this Flyers team makes the playoffs, if he plays a part in their plans. Well, there's that. And, you know, the Flyers haven't been getting any saves lately, right? I mean, that, that's that been, I mean, I, I don't know how much you could expect. I mean, the guy comes over, he's never played North American hockey. There's eight games left in the regular season. They're, they're obviously games that carry high stakes. Like it's it's not an ideal spot to be, uh, thrown into, you know, if he does get to play even, you know, multiple games here down the stretch. Um, but, you know, the, the latest John Tortorella dust up, if you call it with the media, I'm sure you saw earlier this week, he apologized, you know, he'd been asked about Felix Sandstrom's performance in a game last weekend and he walked off the podium without giving an answer and ended up apologizing for that. I mean, you know, you don't want to make light of it, but the, the Flyers crease has been sort of a cursed place. <laughs> It seems, I mean, it's just been a, a very difficult market on goaltenders um, and not, not a place that a lot of goalies have thrived. I mean, you go, you go back over a huge number of years. The Brisgalov thing 40 was a, years. Yeah, and the Brisgalov thing was once upon a time going to solve it. And, and you know, we know what happened then. You know, it's, it's just a, it feels like somehow organizations get something in their DNA and they're trying to solve the same problem or that they have a certain style. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't know, really know what to expect from the player. I mean, you, you can go to, you know, elite prospects and look up, you know, all his, all his numbers. And, and there's some pretty impressive numbers there and achievements uh, for Ivan Fedotov, but 
you know, to, to arrive this late in March and potentially be playing like the biggest games of the season. Like, it seems like that's at least a possibility uh, because they've, you know, they've, they've struggled. They've had some injuries. And then obviously the Carter Hart situation where he left the team on personal leave this year while the, the Hockey Canada, you know, proceedings enter the courts. So it's, uh, I guess, I guess it's all upside because if it doesn't go well for Fedotov this year, I mean, are you really going to hold it against him? But it's, it's very unusual circumstances. I do know the Flyers, though. I mean, obviously, they, they, they've they liked the player. If, if in an alternate universe where you don't have the Russia-Ukraine situation and then whatever machinations in Russia led to him being essentially arrested and sent to a military camp in, in a far region of their country, you know, he, you know, in an alternate universe, he's in Philadelphia, you know, in the, the spring slash fall of 2022, and he's he's coming to the end of his second NHL season and maybe he's a known pro- product by now instead, you know, a couple months before he can be an unrestricted free agent, they're going to get at least some kind of quick look at him here. I, I wonder even if he, I mean, I'll ask the, the opposite of the last question I asked, but if he doesn't get to play in any games, if the, does the team like him enough to at least sign him to another contract this off season? I think there's a path to that. And, and, you know, my sense is, is that, that he it's not as though he's not trying to use the leverage of unrestricted free agency here. I mean, his situation is is obviously much bigger than the NHL's collective bargaining agreement rules. And, and you know, the reason he can be a UFA is because he's 27 years old. Um, you know, I think he wants to ideally turn this into an NHL career. Right. He wants. And, and you know, I don't think there's there's certainly no issue with him in Philadelphia. Again, this isn't this isn't a typical or this isn't the sort of situation where he's playing hardball and trying to end up somewhere else. It's just, I think in a, in a strange way, I think it's a harder decision for the team because look, any organization only has so many goaltending slots. Uh, Obviously the flyers do have some, some young prospects at that position. I I think they're in the process of bringing over another um, Belarusian goaltender that they drafted in the third round a couple of years ago uh, to join the, the organization. So there's a lot of sort of moving parts there and 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 you know you have to make those sort of decisions you know i think you can make that call because if he doesn't play or if he plays one game or you know like if he has minimal impact in the immediate term they could still at least get on the ice with him have their coaches really start to work with the player you know i think that you're not talking he's not signing a five million dollar contract for next season i mean there's there's probably a low low risk you know solution where you know, they're able to extend him and, and, you know, have next year be really his first full NHL season, but we'll have to see how that goes. I mean, I, I don't know, as I say, I know the Flyers like him and I know that he wants to be there, but there's, there's also, you know, the realities of, of only being able to carry so many goalies and who knows how this is going to go. But I think, you know, given all the visa and sort of paperwork stuff that's had the gun on here, obviously he had his contract terminated by CSK in Moscow this yeah. week. I mean, they put a lot of work into getting him here. So I, I would, I think just because of the, that fact, it's, it's reasonable to conclude they'll find a way to, to keep him around for at least one more year to get, get, get eyes on him. Any other question, any, anything else you want to mention about Ivan that I didn't ask you anything to do with how he got to North America or anything else we didn't get to? No, I know that they're, they're sort of keeping it a little bit secret how he got here. I mean, in terms of the route he traveled or what, what had to happen for it to go on. I mean, we know, the political situation in the world right now with Russia still, you know, in an active war with Ukraine that it initiated uh, with Russian athletes still forbidden from, you know, there's a world championship coming up in Prague in May men's world's championship that Russian athletes won't be able to participate in. Uh, They're not going to be part of a four nations tournament. The league's going to have, I mean, this is a very volatile time in the world. And and so I don't know exactly how we got here or everything that went on. I, I, you know, have been to Russia a number of times in my life prior to this conflict. And I will say that it's a sort of place that money can solve a lot of problems for you. Uh, and so, you know, I'm sure that there was some kind of deal reached to get him over here in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, I think it's, and it is an interesting situation and I, I do think they're going to give him a chance to play. I mean, that's ultimately you go to all this, this length, I don't think it's just to, to see him in practice. Right. I mean, so I suppose those decisions have to be made with how the, the playoff races go. I mean, Philadelphia's bare, you know, they're clinging to a spot right now, but you know, they've got Washington. That's, that's kind of surged a little bit. Obviously Detroit's still there that could potentially knock them out of a wild card spot. If Washington passes them and knock the, you know, 
drops into wild card positioning. So there's a lot, there's a lot of moving parts and it's never boring in Philadelphia. I can say that much. It's uh, just, just that kind of team where it seems like there's always something going on. And, and, you know, I think this is a big moment for the organization. I mean, if let's, let's take the optimistic view. He's a seventh round pick nine years ago. I mean, if he becomes a player for them, what a, what a find and what a set of circumstances to have to endure in order, in order to have them come over to North America and play it. So it almost calls back to, you know, the, the path, you know, McGillney took to, I mean, it's not quite the same political climate, but, but, you know, a lot of players had to basically defect in the late eighties, early nineties to come play the NHL. Some of those players became hall of fame type of players. Even if Genny Malkin had to basically escape his contract at the time with Magnitogorsk, when he first joined the Penguins, you know, it was, I believe it all went down in Helsinki. They were there for a tournament or for a game or something like that. And he was, was whisked away in the night. And so, you know, might, might be some, maybe when the, the story's told on this one, when there's a little bit of safety and time and distance, there'll be that kind of covert operation that had to go on in order to get him here. I, I'm not entirely sure that though, as we're, as we're talking today. For sure. And and you're right. It is never boring in Philadelphia. I, I wonder where this story will rank in terms of the storylines for the Philadelphia Flyers at season's end, because I should, I should mention too, because I've seen a bunch of people like on my Twitter feed and stuff when I've been tweeting with this, like he, he signed that contract in 2022. And and that was supposed to be for 2022, 23 season. He's then forced into Russian military service. Essentially the contract was told it's called, but it means pushed to this season. And so he's been on the Flyers reserve list. You know, his contract has been one of their 50 all along. Like, there's no restrictions on how much he could play. I mean, he could he could come in and he could play every game the Flyers have for the rest of the season if the team would want to put him in, into that, including the playoffs. And so, you know, I, I think that there's – I saw some people debating, like, like what's – there's no – you know, I checked with the league. There's no extra, you know, roadblocks or issues with that. So he's 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 fully under contract and – uh he can play as much or as little as the Flyers, you know, want to want to circle his number and put him in the lineup. Okay, we'll leave it there. Uh, I think we're going to end up talking a lot about coaches on this episode. You mentioned John Tortorella in that press conference he had this week, uh, where he gave that stare when describing Felix Sandstrom's performance. At least he apologized for that. But uh, it seems as if uh, the anger kind of spread over to the Atlantic Division. I mean, it feels as if a lot of people were angry for different reasons this week. But especially in the Atlantic Division, if you were coaching, uh, who do you think was matter between these three gentlemen? Uh, Jim Montgomery in Boston, who felt his players weren't giving it a, enough of a go in practice. And then after a game says his team isn't ready for the playoffs. Uh, Sheldon Keefe, who called out a bunch of his own players, including his own captain, John Tavares. Or Paul Maurice, who after a game on Thursday uh, was asked a question about making the playoffs. And he said, and I quote, Today is free quote effing day. Take whatever you think I might say and use it. I won't bitch about it. <laughs> I think Jim Jim Montgomery was probably the most angry because, you know, he stops practice during a first drill. He, he can be heard by the reporters that were in the building, just berating the team and then makes them skate. You know, the, the, the two other examples, Maurice, after the loss to the Islanders on Thursday night, I mean, he's frustrated with his team. He's got a great dry sense of humor. I've never, of all the coaches' answers and all the years that we've both been doing this, man, I've never heard a coach basically say like, "Make up whatever quote you want," and I'm not going to hold it against you because I, I just he didn't want to give his own thoughts, right? That was his way of not sharing his thoughts but making yeah. the point about how frustrated he was. And in Keith's case on Tuesday, the Leafs, you know, had a, a great first period, maybe their best individual period of the season against New Jersey. Got sloppy from there, lost to the Devils in a game that just was untidy all around. He called it an immature game. I'd say, you know, everything in Toronto gets dialed up a few notches. My view of it in watching the press conference was he singled out a few players, including his top players, Matthews Nylander and, and Captain John Tavares, as you mentioned by name. But even on the Keith meter, that might not have been as mad as he's been in the last three weeks. Like they they had a loss in Philadelphia actually, where he was quite terse and, and it, the, the, the scrum got cut off pretty abruptly after a loss yes. there that he wasn't happy with. And so, I think this week, if we did like the who's angriest a meter of the teams that are the top three spots in the Atlantic, it's probably the Bruins coach, Jim Montgomery. But, you know, let's let's step back a minute and, and gauge why. I mean, all these gentlemen are looking at the calendar. And if you can believe it, Julian, 
the playoffs start three weeks from Saturday. So we are three weeks just smidge over as we're recording this three weeks from the start of Stanley Cup playoffs. That's game one, by the way. The, the original NHL calendar had the playoffs starting Monday, April 22nd. It's since been moved up to Saturday, April 20th. I would expect the Leafs to play that night, for example, if you're listening. Any to reason for that, by the way? I had heard about that. Well, it, a couple reasons. The entire East, even though the regular season ends on the 18th of April, the entire East is done on the 17th. So right. there actually is a, you know, a two full day break before the Eastern teams that start on the 20th start the playoffs. And I, I think it, it just allows everything to move up. Plus, do you really want to leave a weekend in April free of any hockey? Like it's, it's kind of unusual. Like typically if you look back over time, the NHL regular season usually ends on a Saturday and then the playoffs get going, you know, into the next week, sometimes Tuesday, sometimes Wednesday, but you know, this way they're compressing it back a little bit, gives them a little more freedom to get through the playoffs. And I don't have the date sitting right in front of me. Um, Yep, I know exactly what you're going to say. Uh, some Leafs news has come down the wire just as you're making your point here. Uh, do you want me to say it, or do you, or do you want to, or do you want to do it? You got it. Simo Benoit signing a three-year extension, uh, one point three five mil is the AAV. A Leafs defenseman Simo Benoit signing a three-year contract extension with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I'd say one of the really positive points of this week's season um, yeah seems like he's he's fit you know on he was that, signed, uh, that back line i know he played uh extensively last year in anaheim obviously the ducks did not have a great season he played over 70 games for them he came to camp and was injured initially this year and so it didn't look like he had a great fit he signed as a you know bit of an extra defenseman i would say like depth for the leafs and, and because of injuries and, and illnesses and all sorts of situations that have come on the season He's become a regular member of the team. And even here after acquiring two more defensemen at the trade deadline, um, you know, he still found a semi-regular spot in the lineup. So, you know, obviously good security for him, you know, someone who wasn't qualified last year by the Ducks after playing 70 odd games uh, has never had, you know, three year guaranteed money deal, you know, since being an entry level player. And, you know, I think useful depth for the Leafs. They really like this hard edge, you know, third pairing guy. We're not talking about him getting Norris votes or anything like that, but I, I think he's been very, very useful play, you know, plays with a little bit of physicality that uh, the Brad Tree living would appreciate as, as Leafs general manager. So, um, and, and, you know, I know these negotiations have actually gone on for quite some time now and there is a real give and take and, you know, it's tough. I'm sure as a player like Benoit, I mean, you're, you want to maximize your value. You don't want to, you don't want to sell these years if, if, if you're going to look back and be like, man, I could have made a lot more money. But at the same time, he's obviously earned the trust of the organization. He knows he's in a good spot. He knows somewhere. If you look at the least blue line, I mean, they got TJ Brody is coming up as a, as a UFA, you know, potentially unlikely to be back. Mark Giordano was likely getting to the end of the road. His contract expires this year. I mean, there's going to be opportunity on this blue line. You know, they trade for Labushkin and Edmondson, but no guarantee either of those guys, you know, is extended and stays beyond just this playoff run. And so, I think there's going to be minutes there for Benoit and obviously they like him and you know, 1.35 million is it's nice guaranteed money, but from a, a Leafs organizational perspective, it's not, not breaking the bank. And even if they get to a point where for next year, it doesn't go so well for whatever reason, you could, you could bury 1.15 of that million into, into the minors. So um been a funny season in Toronto. Like obviously the regular season, everyone's waiting for the playoffs, right? Like I don't think yeah. anyone's, getting too excited or, or not by, you know, what's happened during this year, but you know, guys like Bobby McMahon who got a two year extension, you know, last month and, and Simon Benoit have been sort of wins around the margins, I guess, for, for a team that needs a few of those because of uh, how much is paid to the core players. Okay. Uh, I imagine Sheldon Keefe will uh, see this and be in a much better mood than he's been in the last few days. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was in a pretty good mood Thursday night. You know, the Leafs uh, had a pretty thorough win over over Washington and 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 I guess you know if we get back to that thread we were pulling on earlier after sort of calling out singling out however you want to frame it his players you know those guys all responded and you know that was there wasn't much doubt in that game against the Capitals the Leafs you know got a lead didn't sit back and you know get barraged by shots after you know they kept pushing the pace and building on the lead and and you know it wasn't a very competitive game in the end and you know the Capitals have been giving it like they've been in, they've been in playoff chase mode for like two months. And so I think it's, it's only reasonable that 
the emotional tank only has so much energy. I saw TJ Oshie told the reporters after the game, he felt like it was just one of those games where the grind of what they've been through, it caught up to them a little bit, but um, Keith was certainly in a, he was in a pretty joking mood. Actually. I, I was at the press conference last night after the game, you know, Tyler Bertuzzi is another story that's come on really well for the Leaf series. Got, he had six goals into February and he scored 12 goals in his last 17 games. So he's now up to 18. So he's now, he's basically going to probably get a 20, you know, maybe a couple more goal season. And, and that's probably what you would expect, but he's done it in a way you didn't expect because he struggled in, you know, production wise for so much of the year. And, you know, he, Keith was asked about that and he's like, well, you, you got to talk about puck luck. Cause he's like, he scored, he scored a goal last night on Charlie Lindgren from behind the goal line. He's like, before this, he was missing them into an empty net from above the goal line. So, <laughs> um, you know, and he was saying that he wasn't, uh, it was meant to be get a chuckle from everyone, but, uh, wasn't necessarily being literal, but, no. um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, as we were talking about the schedule and, and the coaches, like, I just think there's, there's so much pressure in all those situations, you know, it's almost so obvious we don't have to spell it out, but the Panthers went to a cup final last year and have been one of the top teams in the league. The Bruins have been in the mix forever. You know, want to avenge last season's first round loss to Florida. Toronto is Toronto, you know, one series victory out of the last seven, eight years with this group uh, still looking for a long playoff run. And these teams are all going to have to go through each other. And, you know, obviously if you're behind the bench of one of them, you, you want to be seeing sort of playoff habits already and, and mentality and, and, managing the game and none of them are happy. And at the other side of the division, it's the same thing, Julian. I mean, yep. you know, Detroit has really been scuffling and, and trying to stay in the playoff chase Buffalo. I don't know if you noticed that there were calling for Don Granado's head this week. Uh, you know, some of the local media there and fans, the Sabres, you know, they, they were on the fringes of the playoff race, but they had a you know big game against Ottawa Wednesday night and they're down four, nothing nine minutes in uh, and, and didn't have much pushback. So it's, it's, I think it's a tough league to coach in nowadays. We've already seen so many coaching changes this season. You've got all these people on interim tags. You know, I think it's reasonable to think a team or two that loses in the first round, you know, potentially could be looking at a coaching change. Like you might see six or seven or eight. I don't know how many it's going to end up being coaches switched out of their jobs. And so obviously if you're in one of those jobs, you feel I'm not saying that Montgomery, Maurice and Keith specifically are, reacting the way we've seen them react because they're worried about losing their jobs. But I think there's a high degree of pressure in those jobs and you're, tr you're trying to make sure their team is in a position to, ha to have a long playoff run and have, you know, put off the talk about their job for at least another year. Today's episode of the CJ show is sponsored by Shopify. Let's name some dynamic teammates who got it done. Gronk and Brady, Pippen and Jordan, Venus and Serena. Those are some pretty good ones. What about the perfect teammates when it comes to growing your online business? That's you and Shopify. Shopify is the global e-commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way up to, do we just hit a million order stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're auctioning off autographed apparel or selling sleek skis, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify has you covered. Shopify can also help you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And you could sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify also powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States, and it's the global force behind so many brands like Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash Johnston, all lowercase, shopify.com slash Johnston. Now, to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in, shopify.com slash Johnston. What do you think is Don Granado's future in Buffalo? This is a franchise that has not made the playoffs for over a decade. They thought they'd be at least battling proper for a playoff spot this year, maybe even earlier than that. I mean, this as so many young players have come through that organization. They're rebuilding on top of a rebuild, and they still haven't reached the playoffs. What do you think is next for, for Granado? Does he stay for next year? Is he the guy to lead them in this next phase in their franchise? What's next for him? 
Well, this is where it's hard, right? I mean, last year, Buffalo played right to the last week of the season with reasonable playoff chances. And you, you, you have like a big year from Tage Thompson. You know, Alex Tuck looked great. Even Jeff Skinner had a really strong year. I mean, I think you're looking at that team under Granado and you're like, wow, they're like, they didn't make the big, big step, but they, they took a very measurable step in that season and, and, you know, played meaningful games right to the end. You know, this year has felt like it stagnated a little bit. And so I, I suppose what they're going to have to do is try to get to the bottom of that. My, my impression is it's not, it's not like Sabres management is looking to fire Don Granado. I don't, I don't think they're of that mind. I think they like him. He's still under contract for two seasons beyond this one. He was signed an extension because of some of that growth um, that was shown, for, especially for younger players in the organization. They're still a young team, Julian, too. I think they're, they may actually be the youngest in the league on average. If not, they're, they're right. They're right near that spot. And, you know, but the problem is, like you almost have to separate the two things. You, you want to you want to evaluate the coach specifically if we're talking about his job and and what he's done and and where they're at. But then there's also the external pressure. I mean, fans there are pissed and and they have every right to be. Like I I'm certainly not questioning the fans. I mean, this this will be the thirteenth straight year without a postseason berth. Like entire kids have been like in gone from kindergarten and now they're going to college and never even seen the Sabres play a playoff game. Like it, it, I believe it might be the longest stretch in NHL history. It's certainly among them. And so under that, when, when in the larger context, if you're Kevin Adams, if you're in, you know, ownership, Terry Pagula, like you have to look at absolutely every aspect of the organization and wonder if you can get a little better by making that kind of change. And so it's a long way of saying, I don't get it the sense there's an appetite or an urgency to fire Don Granado, but I don't think almost anything can be ruled out. Um, and that's not, I'm not subtexting just Don. I mean, I'm talking about trades, you know, you, you can't, you can't miss the playoffs for 13 straight years and not feel like it can't get to 14. Right. And, and it's a tough division and there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of things stacked against them. You know, what's ironic about the situation, and this is maybe why I'm not an NHL GM, <laughs> but I look at the decisions they've made over the last couple of seasons, like personnel decisions, the contracts they've signed, like, I actually like what they're building there. And, you know, I've heard a lot of people that I talk to in the industry speak extremely highly of Don Granato as a coach. And so, you know, maybe when the dust settles on the year and the coach merry-go-round starts to go, the carousel spinning, you know, the Sabres are going to have to look at who a potential replacement could be and, and weigh the pros and cons of that. I think Kevin Adams actually has shown himself to be a GM who's not afraid of a hard decision too, right? I mean, this we're talking about someone who traded Jack Eichel and I think did reasonably well in the deal, though obviously Eichel hasn't looked back, won a Stanley Cup in Vegas, and it's been a good fit for him. But, um, you know, I don't know how it's going to play out, but what do you sell there if you're the Sabres? Like, that's what I look at. You know, my old saying, you got to sell winning or you got to sell hope. Like, where is, I don't know if they're going to be good enough to win next year, like win enough to get in the playoffs to like truly take that step. And where do you find hope? Like, man, I don't, I, 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 I honestly feel for the people there. I, I really, I spent a lot of time in Buffalo over the years and, and it's a great hockey market and it's a passionate sports town a very proud sports town and they have just been kicked in the stomach for like a decade decade plus Ugh. this is a franchise that's had to tear everything down they got the top pick they tried to build around him it didn't work they flipped away that pick and now they're starting all over again well, and the idea they had, that they might not have they had three top picks like they had Jeez. eichel they had rasmus Dahlin, they had yes. owen power they had yes. sam reinhardt at number two yes they did like, it's not even, I know they didn't win the lottery famously when McDavid was, was there and they were trying to, and Tim Murray, their GM at the time, didn't, didn't hide his frustration by that outcome. But my point is, is, is you can't even say they've had bad la lottery luck. Like they didn't have the ultimate lottery luck and win McDavid, but they've, you know, they've had a lot of first overall picks. Again, I think they've built a team like, like all those players want to stay there, right? You've gotten the core to sign eight year deals. Like it's not. Just it, they, I don't know. It's it's tough. I don't even, know what you do. 
You look at UPL, like I know he had a tough game in the Senators game that I was mentioning earlier, and you know, he gets pulled after eight or nine minutes, but like he's even had a strong stretch here. Like he looks like he could be a goaltender. They got Devin Levi in the fold. Like it just, it feels, I mean, look, it might be one of those things where once it clicks, it really clicks, but it's, I think the coaching decision is difficult there. I think the personnel decisions are going to be tough and they, I don't know. I, I feel like I've watched several Kevin Adams press conferences over the last two years, like where he's really owned it. It's like, how do you, how do you keep owning it? Like it's just, it's hard. Part of, Part of what you have to do, obviously, is just make really cold decisions, not like leave the fan pressure or ownership pressure out the door and like really do what's best, what you believe is best and like stick to that vision. But the other part of it, this is a business and you and part of it, it's narrative, right? Like part of it is selling a story. And I just don't know what the story is that they're going to be able to sell out of this season because they, they just didn't, they didn't get enough wins on the ice. There's not enough other wins you could point to. It's not like one player took a massive jump. You're like, all right, next year, that guy's going to lead us to the promised land. And so the easiest thing, unfortunately, if you're a coach to do is, is change a coach. So I, again, I'm not saying Don Granado will be changed. I don't think that that's anyone's intention, but it, nothing can be off the table when you've had the run that that organization has had. For sure. At least for them. I mean, when they acquired Bo and Byron from Colorado, he looks like he's been fitting just fine on that on that defense. And at least that looks like a strong point for them in the future. But yeah, something's going to have to ch- might have to change up front, too. Well, if uh, they look want at their more top success. four, right? You got it's Darlene insane. Power, you know, Samuelson's locked in pretty steady guys, probably the number four and Byram like and, and they're all like 22 and under. It's a that's stacked. That's that's a perf. That's perfect. Like you would think you know, there's the other aspects of a team, but I'm t- that's what I'm saying. Like they got a young, youngish goaltender who looks like he's promising. They've got all these forward prospects. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's a hard league. I'll tell you, it's a pretty good advertisement for anyone who's in any market who wants to burn everything to the ground. That's a good way to put it. Cause they, Sabres they, fans can be very passionate about that. They know, they know all about burning stuff and, and, Maybe a table off to get involved in that too, but yes. But it, like Steve could do a great like series of trade trees or like origin stories. When you look back at it, this all start, like they truly tanked for McDavid, right? Like they had yes. close to, you know, bottom five, bottom 10 ever NHL season. They obviously didn't win that lottery. They still got Jack Eichel, pretty good bounce. Um, not a bad consolation prize in that case, but this all goes back to that time. Like they, they just have never been able to get enough traction since then because you trade away all your good players. You know, I, I watched the capitals and they did, they didn't play a great game in Toronto. The one I saw on Thursday, but you know, they, they are having the best of both worlds right now. Like they have gotten considerably younger. They still have Alex Ovechkin on their roster. Who's obviously a franchise cornerstone chasing a all time record in the league, like a hallowed record. And they're legitimately in a playoff race and they're having these young guys, be part of that like like that's to me that's the model if if the, the model does not fall to the bottom of the league like like Edmonton it took forever and they fell to the bottom of the league and traded absolutely everything useful I actually think Chicago is going to be an interesting case it's not a prediction I, I don't know what's going to happen there but they because what Chicago did right is they traded away players still in their early to mid twenties that were useful or be better than useful. Like they traded away Alex to instead of keeping them right. They traded away Brandon Hagel and yeah, they got two first round picks from Tampa, but those players could have insulated like the Bedards and the Korchinskis and, and the young guys as they came in. And I know they've signed, you know, Nick Felinos and, and Jason Dickinson's had a good year. Like they've done, but I just wonder, I think there's danger of removing every layer of protection. Like it's just, it's hard to build up, that kind of cadre of useful players. And I get why they did it. They, they went all in on the draft. And again, it's not a prediction. I think it's too soon to say, but it, I do worry or wonder, like, are they going to be paying Connor Bedard, you know, as one of the top players in the league before they've had a chance to truly be in a playoff spot? I think it's possible. Is yeah, there, I, they're I, a long I way away. So, yeah. Right. Whereas if you look back and like the Leafs have earned any sort of, joke about what's happened in the postseason, but what the Leafs did is the one year that they got really bad and, and happened to win the Austin Matthews lottery, but they also at that time kept around players like Nazem Kadri, James Van Riemsdyk, 
Tyler Bozak, like players that were very useful NHL players. They didn't just trade every NHL player off their roster. And I think that that helped. It, it, it allowed them in Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner's and William Nylander's first full NHL season make the playoffs because they had veteran players that were useful contributors. And obviously over time, those players moved on or were traded left in free agency, what have you. But I think that that's the way you got to go. And, and, and so that's sort of like the capitals are trying to mimic that. I think the penguins you're, we're going to see them try to do something like this. Like it's one thing to trade Jake Ensel. I get why you do it, but you, you can't strip the roster of every useful player. Cause it could be like five seasons of horrible before you even got a chance to be excited again. We'll throw the flames in that too. I mean, contracts kind of play a role in that, but they're not tearing everything down to the studs either. Right. And that's smart. Like, I think ultimately as much as we talked, we, I don't know how many hours, like if you, if we did like a season three, like highlight video of our, of our pod, Julian, Calgary like flames, a, Calgary flames. it was so much talk about like all the guys that were going to trade. Should they trade Markstrom? But you're like, I, I, there is some wisdom as much as I get that fans like the idea of winning the number one pick. And like, there's some magic in that. Like they're really, it's, that is exciting. Like when we talk about selling something, it's pretty exciting when your team gets to pick a superstar player and, and you get to sort of watch that person grow up on your team, that's great. But there's a cost. Like you can't, you need that guy to play with someone. That's, that's how I look at it. Like You're I right. I, like who is Connor Bedard had to play with this year? And I say it with respect to his line mates, but they're just, it's a tough season. Like what's his, like what's he minus? Like he's minus a billion. Minus probably isn't that good. And I don't have hockey fizz in front of me to see like who all his line mates have been. But yeah, to your point, it, it probably would have been a much different situation if you had those players you mentioned earlier to help insulate that situation. The other counterpoint to uh, your argument essentially is that if you look at some of those teams that have won, they still have some, at least a few of those first round picks somewhere littered around their roster. Like a Colorado was bad for a while. And Nathan McKinnon and, and Kale McCarr are leading the charge. Number one overall pick and a top five pick. Well, and if you remember that time, like there was rumors about Gabe Landeskog trades and they didn't trade yes. Landeskog. Um, they did trade Matt Duchesne. Another but time. at that, by the end, you know, and Duchesne was a number three overall pick, but Duchesne wanted out at the time, at the end. I think it was both sides that had enough. And I don't remember what they all got in that Duchesne trade, but I, if, if I recall, it was a pretty good return. So at least, you know, that allowed them to keep going. You know, it's, it's so easy for us. Like we're just sitting, I'm, I'm here in my chilling at my house, sitting behind my microphone going like, ah, oh. like a year's worth of decisions. I can boil down to a 12 second clip and be like, why'd they do that? Or that was a good idea. Like the truth is obviously when you're in the, when you're in the, the manager suite making these decisions or in the front office, like it's, it's a lot easier. <laughs> it's a lot easier to Monday morning quarterback, which is what we, we get to do than, than actually be the one tasked with those decisions. I just, I just think that there's enough, again, high level, if I'm just being very general, there's, there's enough evidence to suggest stripping your roster down and like t doing a total full rebuild, like truly full rebuild is, is not the way to go. I, I right. just, I can't think of many, you know, now we're, we're what, 20 plus years into a cap, right? Or 20 years yes. into a cap, basically. Yeah. You know. That we, we now understand like it, it was a brand new system. So like what happened in 2008 wasn't really comparable to what happened in 2002, even though only six years had passed. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of like learnings in that because it, the whole system changed. Well, now we have 20 years of material and a lot of teams have tried to build right through the draft only. And I just think those teams are spinning their wheels. Whereas the ones that are rebuilding on the fly, you know, the Bruins did it at one point, they missed the playoffs two years in a row. You know, had a nice two years where they had David Pasternak and Charlie McAvoy, among others, to their organization through their drafting in those two years. And and then, you know, look where those are now cornerstone pieces of the current team. But I don't think you want to get truly bad, even as much as it it might be satisfying as a fan when you're so tired of your team and you just feel like there's nothing left. But I think it's got to be a process. We know how you feel about rebuilding. We're going to have to get you to do some kind of franchise mode on, on Chell where you show us how a team should be properly retooled. I do you would, think I could I win a cup sooner that. than Jesse Blake? Or I, Yes, I believe that. I believe you could. I believe you could. Uh, it's Easter weekend. Uh, I'm sure you've got Easter plans. Uh, I got to figure out my Easter plans. 
Uh, so we're going to head on out of here pretty early. Uh, do you have a stick tap for this week? Yeah, I'm going to do two. Okay. Um, a current leaf and a former leaf. Uh, okay, current, here we go. The current, the current leaf would be Mark Giordano, who, uh, you know, a nice moment on Thursday night, scored a goal. It's only his third game uh, since his father, Paul, died on February 16th. Suddenly, uh, he, he was befelled by a concussion after that in a game at the end of February. Obviously, he's fallen down the depth chart with the deals they made to get Labushkin and Edmondson at the deadline. And so it was unclear when he might play again or how much he might play. It was actually not supposed to play in Thursday night's game. But Timothy Lilligren was sort of a quote unquote game time decision, couldn't go. And Giordano opens the scoring, only second goal of the season, not someone you expect to score, and uh, you know, raises his left, you know, hand up to the sky, something he promised his family would do in honor of his dad, Paul. Kind of remind me of uh what was his name? James Joey McDonald, was it? No. Oh, oh, the are you thinking of the Blue Jays? The, the uh, Blue hitter? Jays, uh, McDonald. John McDonald. John, John McDonald. McDonald. Pardon me. John McDonald. Joey McDonald's former NHL goalie. But remember yes. when he he hit a a home run returning after his dad's death? It turned out to be on Father's Day. Yes. It, when that home run happened, but it, you know it was like an unlikely guy to have that that happen in the moment. He was not a power hitter by any stretch, and it was emotional. It kind of reminded me of that for for Mark Giordano. So I thought, you know, look at you don't want to trivialize what a difficult time it's been for him and his family. Talking about the oldest skater in the NHL, someone who's given his all trying to win a Stanley Cup. I thought that was nice. And then, of course, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to Zach Hyman, um, who's found his name in the media a lot this week. And, you know, it's pretty, I've made my thoughts clear on Twitter where I stand, but I, I think Zach is to go from the fourth line player at Michigan who barely played to someone who scored 51 and counting goals in the NHL this season at age 31. Um, that's not an easy thing to do for anyone, no matter where you've come from. And I just want to shout out Zach as well. All right, cool. Uh, I'll give my stick tap to uh, Marty St. Louis, the uh, Canadian's head coach who needs some time away uh, for personal reasons. I believe his son had suffered a, a hockey injury and he surprised his team uh, earlier this week when they were in Colorado uh, and returned behind the bench. Uh, obviously players on the team, they like him. They, they care a lot about him. And uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it seems like things are getting better with his family and now he's able to coach again, full marks and uh, a stick a stick tap required for that. So I just wanted to shout out the Montreal Canadiens and Martin St. Louis for this week's stick tap, at least on my end. And uh, yeah, good, cool that uh, you were able to get two in there. Yeah, I don't usually do that, <laughs> but I, I didn't I didn't yeah. want to have to choose between one or the other. And they, you yeah. know, easy tie with them, former leave, current leave. I should say two to you, Julian. I, in the spirit of Easter, I yes. will not ridicule any of your chocolate choices. You can have whatever chocolate you want this weekend, whatever the Easter bunny leaves at your door. I hope you enjoy it, my friend. <laughs> I hope you get all the arrow bars you want, CJ. Uh, hey, I look. So I hope so, too. <laughs> hey, look. Hockey people being peaceful. Great. We need a little bit more of that after this week. Yeah, get your, that, yeah, that's true. But we're going to get feisty again. We got three weeks till the playoffs, bud. Yeah, trust me. There's a lot of things to be feisty about over these next few weeks and into the postseason as well. Get your questions in now for our Monday show for Ask CJ. We'll get to as many as we can and subscribe to our podcast. Also, join the SDPN Discord. It's a fun time. Great communities being built over there. I promise you it's a fun time. Anyway, enjoy your Easter weekend. We'll talk to you all on Monday. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK and McKenzie.